One of the most basic facts of Yu-Gi-Oh! is there are three types of cards, monsters, spells, and traps. While monsters and spells are always relevant no matter how much the game is sped up, traps have fallen behind in some regards. With modern duels relying on moves that you can do right away with spells and monster effects, traps are considered slow. You have to set them on your turn, and you can't activate them until at least a turn later, so it's harder to plan on them if your opponent goes first, and they're more reactive. Many any of them relying on your opponent to make a move, or they're just floodgates. Some of the best trap cards are as good as they are because they break the rules of needing to be set or waiting a turn, like Infinite Impermanence or Red Reboot, but generally, traps are more niche nowadays if you don't have a plan or combo. To support traps, Konami occasionally releases new archetypes that base their strategies around using trap cards. These archetypes use monsters that have effects that work well with their special trap cards, or just traps in general. Whether they can swarm the field with traps, get bonus effects when traps are activated, or let the traps do the heavy lifting and activate their effects to summon the big bosses of the decks. While these decks can still use spells, traps are their main gimmick. And since I like using these decks, let's look at my favorites, partially based on how good they are, but also based on how much I like them. These also don't have to be full-on archetypes. They can just be a group of similar monsters or cards that function like an archetype. I also want to highlight their aesthetics, with trap cards literally being traps that you set in the game for your opponent to fall into, I want to discuss how these archetypes look like the devious characters who would strategize around sneaky traps. And since we're looking at aesthetics, I'll be joined by my co-host who just watches Yu-Gi-Oh! Judgment Meter. Um, if someone wants to tell me how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! in the comments, good luck with that. Now, let's reveal the top 10 Yu-Gi-Oh! archetypes based around traps. Number 10, Amazement. Amazement is the story about a guy who wants to make the best amusement park in the world, and all the rides and attractions are trap cards. So come and enter this carnival of dreams and or nightmares. Each trap is called an Amaze Attraction, and showcases the events at this park, with the main gimmick being that you can equip the traps to either an Amazement monster that you control, or one of your opponent's monsters for differing effects. Expectedly, if you choose your own, you get a positive effect, but if you equip it to your opponent, they get a negative effect. You got attractions like the Cyclo Coaster, which lets your monster pop a back row once per turn if equipped to you, or let you search a monster if equipped on your opponent. There's also the Horror House, which lets you negate an opponent's monster effect once per turn, or flips them face down. If that's too scary for you, try out the Merry-Go-Round, which either boosts your attack by 500 and gives you a hit of destruction prevention, or lowers your opponent's monster's attack by 500 per trap equipped to them. Rapid races let you shuffle a monster back into the deck, or change your opponent's monster's level and battle position. And feel free to check out Wonder Wheel, which lets you exchange a card in your hand for a draw one, or swaps your opponent's attack and defense for a turn. Then you can clean it up with Family Faces, which only equips your opponent's monster to take control of them. To set up your rides, you have your monsters. The Assistant and the Attendant have effects that let them set attraction traps from the deck. Bufo the Mascot lets you recover traps from the graveyard and moves traps equipped to other monsters, and the ringleader Arlecchino does a lot. He can banish attraction traps to destroy monsters, and when any trap is activated, not just attractions, he can special summon himself from the hand. After he's summoned, he can equip attraction traps directly from the deck to the opponent's monsters when they're summoned. He also has an evil version called Amazement Abomination Arlecchino, who special summons himself when another amazement monster is on the field, and he can and swap himself for a normal Arlecchino from the deck. And this opens up the question, what's this guy's deal? Is this a Jekyll and Hyde scenario where they're both the same Arlecchino? Is this a prop from the haunted house? Is he a twin or rival carnival leader? I'm not sure how trustworthy Arlecchino is in general, since the so-called evil version is actually a light monster and the original is dark, so could he be up to trouble behind the scenes? I was always kinda dubious of these rides because they're traps, as if they're trapping the opponent to ride on them against their will, since they're always experiencing an effect that works against them when equipped. 
Think of the ride just appearing out of nowhere and then it ties up the opponent to force them to have fun. Or maybe he's just overzealous to show the opponent his new ride and it harms them by accident since he's having a blast on these cards. How could you not have fun looking at his face? He looks like he, he would have a good time, but he would make everyone else have a good time too. I also like how he inflated the Kuribis. Karibos. Karibos. They look similar though. And the fir first, the one in the front is pink. I wouldn't go near those balloons. I don't trust that they're not a trap too. Yeah, you can have the balloon and just, just fly. Uh-oh. Oh, oh it's a bear with a balloon. Oh, and he has a little vest. Aw, what a chipper bear. The final note is these rides are all based on other monsters and archetypes. Some picks are obvious, like Ghost Trick for the Haunted House, Plunder for the Viking Ship, or F.A. for the Go-Karts, but then you have some random picks, like Metal Dragon for the Train, Nephthys for the Roller Coaster, and the Ojamas for the Ferris Wheel. And what's that? Is that one of the creatures from Ojama Country? I thought they all died. Oh, there's extra lore here I'm not ready for. Number 9, the Apophis and Tiki Trap Monsters. This isn't so much of an archetype as it is a group of cards that have something in common with effects that support that thing in common. These are continuous traps, and sometimes normal traps, that start as traps, but when flipped, their effects let them turn into a monster card that still counts as a trap when in the monster zone. Some trap monsters are part of an archetype, like the Shadal or Monarch ones, and those ones usually just support their respective archetypes. But for the trap monsters that just exist outside of a major archetype, they usually get an effect that supports monsters that are also traps. The two non-archetype trap monsters that come to mind first are the Apophis and Tiki traps. There's just two of each of them, but they set the stage for trap monsters in the future. Embodiment of Apophis was the first trap monster and was an ace monster of Odeon in the anime, so it had some name recognition to its reputation. However, since it was the first, its gimmick was just that it was a trap and monster and that's it, so they didn't give it any other effect. It was just a reptile with middling stats when on the field, and it could only be activated during the main phase, which takes away from its stealth not being able to be activated during the battle phase. But I guess they were afraid of making this type of monster too strong with nothing like it before. It got retrained many years later into Apophis the Swamp Deity, and now with the knowledge that trap monsters exist, it gains an effect. It still can only be activated during the main phase, and only has slightly bigger stats than the original, but now now after it becomes a monster, it's able to negate your opponent's monster effects, one negate per continuous trap on the field, which would include all those other trap monsters that you would play with this card. So this effect is still kinda bad. Like you already have to have the field swarmed with trap monsters to pull off the effect, or have continuous traps up that probably do its job better, like Gozen Match, or Rivalry of Warlords, or Skill Drain. Plus, Deity's effect only lasts until the end of the turn, which makes it even worse, so just play Skill Drain. The Tiki's fared much better as trap monsters, with Tiki Curse and Soul. Nothing groundbreaking, but I like that they protect your trap monsters. Curse acts as a revenge monster, where if another trap monster you have battles, it destroys the opponent's monster regardless. For Soul, when another trap monster is destroyed, it lets you set them again instead of sending them to the graveyard, so you can resummon them next turn. Then there's all the assorted trap monsters that work with these guys. Just to name a few, Swamp Mirror and Quantum Cat are trap monsters that choose their type and attribute to be used in other combos. Shape Sister turns into a tuner for a quick synchro when activated. Metamorphortress takes the stats of one of your monsters. Zone of the Spirit deals burn damage when it's destroyed. Metal Reflex Slime is a big booty who sits in defense mode and is not so secret Egyptian god support. And Statue of Anguish Pattern has small boss monster vibes, where it can't be targeted when other trap monsters are on the field and it can destroy one card every time a trap monster is summoned. I associate a lot of these cards with Duel Links, since they made most of them free without needing the in-game currency, so trap monster decks were very accessible even if they weren't that good, and they got bonuses if you used some of Odeon's skills with them. He even had some special summoning lines for some of the trap monsters, despite never using them since he was the innovator of them. They may not be viable, but they're at least a fun casual deck. Number 8, The Counter Fairy. The Counter Fairies are an archetype that could have been forgotten in the past, but they weren't. They started off as a few gimmick monsters that worked with counter traps, but Konami eventually gave them a structure deck and combined them with some other iconic fairies from the game's history. They're not even an archetype, they're just a bunch of monsters that all synergize with each other since they have enough aspects in common. They're all light fairies.
fairies whose effects activate when counter traps go off, or they help you get counter traps in your hand around the field. Counter traps are the hardest traps for your opponent to react to, where their effects usually have an end all be all negate that can only be stopped by another counter trap, otherwise you can't even chain effects to them. Though they're sometimes hard to use since your opponent needs to do a specific action to get them to activate, and they can come with a hefty cost for a better effect, with the most famous one probably being Solemn Judgment, which pays half your life points, but you do get to negate any summon or a spell or trap activation. The original wave of counter fairies was released in the GX era, when new cards had pretty slow or limited effects, so this series of monsters didn't really get you anywhere. You had small effects like Bountiful Artemis, who lets you draw one card after a counter trap is activated, Layard the Liberator, who adds two banished fairies to your hand after a counter trap is activated, Mel Teal Sage of the Sky, who gains life points after a counter trap is activated, Synthetic Seraphim, who summons tokens after a counter trap is activated, and Harvest Angel of Wisdom, who does nothing after counter traps are activated. This one just recovers counter traps from the graveyard when it's destroyed. The main idea was to use the generic fairy support at the time to protect or summon your monsters while you set up your board, and then prevent your opponent from doing things with the counter traps so your fairies can pop off. You had cards like Sanctuary in the Sky to protect your life points, or Nova Summoner to act as your recruiter. And then you can summon your big boss, Voltanus the Adjudicator, who tributes all the monsters on your side of the field to special summon itself after a counter trap is activated, and then it can wipe your opponent's field. Long story short, these effects didn't work out, but about a decade after their debut, they got a structure deck, Wave of Light, and they became more cohesive. They got a pendulum scale with Guiding Ariande, who makes it where they don't have to pay points to activate counter traps, and Minerva Scholar of the Sky, who gets an attack point boost after counter trap activations. They even got a new boss monster, with Sacred Arc Aeronite Parshath, relating to one of the classic fairy monsters, Aeronite Parshath, who does it all, special summons himself after a counter trap is activated, searches counter traps, and inflicts piercing damage. They even let him summon himself after an effect is negated in any way, not just from a counter trap, to modernize the playstyle. But in the end, despite how cool this deck was when it got going, it didn't quite have the gas to keep on going in its current state, with two major flaws in my opinion. First, they made it counter trap focused. As mentioned, it's an unreliable method of triggering effects since it's reliant on your opponent to make a move. They needed more effects that aren't as reactive to support these guys. The main reason behind making these guys focused around counter traps is some of the best classic counter traps had a heaven theme, with the solemn cards depicting a god, and the horns of heaven having heaven in their name, so it made sense to have fairies support them since fairy is just the angel type in Japanese. And second, I feel like they still needed to be an archetype. They sort of dug themselves in a hole by making so many to begin with without an archetype name, so later support just followed the theme of making them based on famous angels in mythology and focused on making Parshath the archetype, which definitely helped, but I feel like the agents ultimately turned out to be better fairy monsters to play with that support. Still, there's fun in noticing all the Greek and Roman mythology references in them. That's pretty. It kind of looks like that white pot from the Pot of Grease series. Well, she's not a pot, but I don't quite understand the design direction they sometimes went with. She's supposed to be Ariadne. I don't know how any of these relate to the goddesses that they stand for, but they're cool looking. Indeed they are. Now hopefully they can get a good effect revamp someday. Number 7, the Paleozoics. Now if you want a trap monster deck, this one's for you. Every main deck monster is a trap, but they have good effects when they're traps that don't turn them into monsters right away. Some of the highlights are Kanadia acting as a Book of Moon and flipping a monster face down, Olenoides being a dust tornado and destroying a back row, Hallucigenia cutting a monster's stats in half, and Dinomicious being a Karma Cut that lets you banish one of your opponent's face-up cards, which is surprisingly stronger than Karma Cut since it targets spells and traps too, and the discard occurs after the targeting, so you don't have to discard if the effect is negated. After these traps are in your graveyard, that's when they can turn into monsters. When a trap card is activated, they can summon themselves from the graveyard as a level 2 aqua water monster with 1200 attack and 0 defense to swarm the field. It's once per chain, so you can only bring one back at a time, but since the deck tends to be trap focused, it's easy to get new chains started or chain them to your opponent's traps. They're also unaffected by monster effects when they're monsters for an added bonus, 
but you do have to banish them after they leave the field as a monster, so you can't loop them. In addition, there's Paleozoic trap effects that support them, like Lean Choilia getting banished Paleozoics back into the graveyard, Merla sending a trap right from the deck to the graveyard, or Pika Ia letting you draw after discarding a Paleozoic. The cool part of their design is they're based on prehistoric aquatic creatures found in the fossilized material known as the Burgess Shale, with their Japanese name being Burgess Toma. Their English name instead references the historical era they're from, being the Paleozoic Era. The Paleozoics get a bit more power with their Xyz monsters. If you have traps as their material, which you'll likely be using if you're playing a Paleozoic deck, you get their effects. Their defensive monster, Opabinia, is their searcher that lets you add a Paleozoic from the deck to the hand. It also lets you activate Paleozoic traps right from your hand, essentially turning them into quick play spells. And the offensive one, Anomalocaris, lets you excavate for a trap when another trap is activated, along with letting you detach to destroy a card. And as a cool detail, they either have 2400 attack or defense, since they're likely made up of two 1200 attack Paleozoics. These guys have that boss monster feel, since they're double a normal Paleozoic, and they can probably crush you between their claws. Or, I don't know, maybe they're cute. He looks friendly. He looks like he just wants to play, like a big puppy, but he's just really big and kind of prickly. What about Opabinia? I like this one because it looks like one of those toys that just go I don't know how you people take me seriously. Finally, their Link monster, Cambro Raster, lets you send a set Paleozoic, or any trap for that matter, to the graveyard, and then you can set a Paleozoic directly from your deck and activate it that same turn. Overall, Paleozoics are a nice little engine, and being a bunch of level 2 water monsters, they fit in well with some of their other aquatic peers from other archetypes. Number 6, the Phantom Knights. The Phantom Knights are a pretty well-supported archetype. They're the deck of Yuto from the Arc 5 anime, so they have the name relevancy that helps them keep on getting new cards. They usually just play a small package of traps, and focus on swarming the field to get out their extra deck monsters. Even when the deck came out in 2016, you weren't using many of their wide array of traps. However, the deck supports getting their traps on the field regardless, so there is still high incentive to putting the traps in your deck. Some boost yourself or weaken your opponent, while others turn into trap monsters that just count as monsters on the field. The traps that don't turn into monsters are supposed to be the weapons of the knights, being Phantom Knight's Wings, which boosts a monster's attack by 500 and gives them a hit of destruction prevention, and Fog Blade, which negates a monster's effects and prevents them from attacking. This is also a continuous trap, so it stays on the field, making it susceptible to back row removal. And the least popular of the weapon's traps is Phantom Knight's Sword, which does what Wings does with a bit more of an attack point boost, but as a continuous trap. And then all of them can banish themselves from the graveyard to revive a Phantom Knight monster, adding to why these traps are still useful in modern decks. As for the trap monsters, Shade Brigandine is really the only one that's consistently in these decks, since not only can it turn into a level 4 monster for your Xyz and Link summoning, but it can summon itself the turn it was set if you have no traps in your graveyard, making it a great card for your opening hand and one of the first traps that you'd search with the Phantom Knight's effects. Even if you draw it late in the duel, the other traps have banishing effects to get out of the graveyard to let Brigandine stay live the turn it's set. The rest of the trap monsters though don't really get used since they're not as convenient to summon as Brigandine is, but they're at least cool to look at. I like Dark Gauntlets since he looks like Metal Morph. The idea behind the design of the trap monsters is similar to the monsters of the main deck, where they're normal pieces of armor animated by the Phantom Knight's ghostly charm. The monsters of the main deck seem to have more of a physical body than the trap monsters, which are more just possessed armor, so that's the main thing that differentiates them from a design standpoint. Phantom Boots and Ancient Cloak are your best main deck monsters, since they can banish themselves from the graveyard to search cards, with Silent Boots being the trap searcher. Torn Scales is also good since it can foolish burial any Phantom Knight's card, including the traps if you need a quick graveyard revive. And their main link monster, the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche, can set any Phantom Knight's trap from the deck directly to the field, making it even easier to use these traps. Despite their army of trap monsters,
monsters and support for them, I still tend to forget that this can count as a trap focus deck, which is the only thing holding it back on this list. The deck has a lot of movement where it may not need most of its traps and it can use rank up magic, but the effects of its best monsters make sure to keep the Phantom Knight's trap dream alive. Number 5, Altergeist. Altergeist are cybernetic ghost lady creatures who are actually spellcasters that work with their trap cards and mutually search each other. All their names and designs combine mythical creatures with computer terminology, like Malwisp being Will-O-Wisp and Malware, or Pukwari being Puka plus Query. And the idea of them using traps is they're constantly finding new ways to invade the cyberverse with their sneaky methods, or reviving their digital bodies in computerized ways. Even if they don't resemble the mythical creatures that they're based on, they still look cool, and they were used by Ghost Girl in the anime, which raises their stock for me. Look this character in the eye and tell her she's not awesome. You can't. She's a cyber ninja. What's not to love about Ghost Girl? I don't care that she only won a single major duel in the anime. She's great. Whether you're setting or searching, the best monsters of the main deck are constantly able to fill your zones in one way or another, and the best traps of the archetype are continuous traps, so you have constant protection and effects activating. Their main trap is personal spoofing, which lets you shuffle an altergeist monster from your hand back into the deck to search for another altergeist. A search every turn is pretty strong, which I guess is why they didn't put altergeist in the trap name so you can't search it with the other altergeist effects. The rest of the continuous traps offer protection. Protocol negates monster effects if you send a face-up altergeist card to your graveyard, working with your other continuous traps. Haunted Rock negates opponent's traps. Fallover keeps your resources going by replacing an altergeist destroyed with a new one from your hand. And if you're afraid of the old Harpy's Feather Duster, Emulate Elf is a trap monster that protects your traps from being destroyed or targeted. And Protocol has the extra effect that prevents your altergeist traps from being negated, so they're here to stay. The normal traps of the archetype tend to stick to the field too, since they equipped your altergeist monsters. Camouflage protects them from being targeted, and Manifestation is basically a call of the haunted and revives an altergeist. Revitalization is the only one that doesn't stick to the field, being a graveyard revive without an equip plus a free summon. All these traps are great for control, but what about the monsters? Well, their effects just let them keep moving. Marionetter lets you set a trap when summoned to get your back row going and can exchange one altergeist on the field for one in the graveyard. Multifaker knows that traps rule this deck and can special summon itself from the hand when any trap is activated, so it's not limited to just altergeist traps and can work with spoofing or whatever other traps you enjoy. Then when it's special summoned, you can special summon another altergeist from the deck. So Quietus can bounce an altergeist card that you control and one of your opponent's cards, and since most altergeists have good effects when they're in the hand, this is a pretty nice trade-off. It can also recover traps after it's sent to the graveyard, which happens a lot with this being a link summoning deck. Malwisp special summons itself when added to the hand and can special summon monsters from the graveyard. Pukuri can be used as link material from the hand. The mermaid can attack direct, and then you got a bunch of other cards in the main deck. But with the deck being able to swarm the field with smaller monsters, it builds you up for the bosses of the deck, the link monsters. Most of them just have good negation or pumping up effects that don't need traps, especially Hextia, but their main trap recursion link boss is Edminia, who lets you set a trap when it's summoned. That being said, if you get the link monsters on the field, you likely have all your back rows set up already, so they can just go to town without worries. Number 4, Eldlich. Eldlich could be considered a mixed deck, but considering all of its monsters are trap monsters, besides the boss and fusion that no one ever uses, I think the focus is more on traps than anything else. Your main goal is to get out Eldlich, the Golden Lord, who's just a big guy with big stats, but his traps protect him and give him ways to resummon himself. If he's in your hand, you can send him and a spell or trap from your hand to the graveyard, which then lets you send one of your opponent's cards to the graveyard. Then you can trigger his graveyard effect. When he's in the graveyard, you can send one of the spells or traps that you control to the graveyard to special summon him with a 1000 attack and defense point boost and effect destruction prevention until the end of your opponent's next turn. While some of his continuous spells could be used with these effects, there's a high likelihood you'll be using his trap monster 
monsters as cost. He has three trap monsters, Conquistador, Guardian, and Huacuero. All three of these are just regular trap monsters when summoned on their own, but if Golden Lord is on the field, they get bonus effects. Conquistador pops a card, Guardian lowers a monster's attack to zero, and Huacuero banishes a card from either graveyard. These trap monsters all still count as traps, so they can be used with Lord's resummoning effect that needs a trap or spell on the field, and their monsters, so they can be used as cost for the archetype's Omni Negate counter trap that needs a zombie monster. All the trap monsters also have the clause that you can banish them from the graveyard at the end of the turn to set an Eldritch spell or trap, so you can get your board ready for more Eldritch action next turn. Besides setting more trap monsters and some quick play spells with this effect, you're also probably setting the Eldlixir of Scarlet Sanguine Trap, which lets you straight up summon Golden Lord from the deck, or another zombie monster if you already have Lord on the field. And once again, you can banish this trap from your graveyard at the end of the turn to set another Eldritch card. This archetype is good at swarming back row thanks to the graveyard traps. The lore idea behind making all these trap monsters is you're wandering into the Golden Lord's territory, trying to steal his treasure, or you're just lost. And from beyond the grave, zombies of people or animals who made the same mistake of entering the Golden Land rise up to mindlessly protect the domain of the Golden Lord. You can tell if they've been infected by the Golden Curse since their body starts to turn gold, just like the Golden Lord himself. Oh my goodness, they're doing Thriller. Even the zombie pirates are turning gold, and they can't even spend it. But enough about the other guys. What do you think about how the Golden Lord himself looks? It looks like he made toast and then turned it gold at the bottom. What? Where? Oh, it's negative space from his cape. I'm still gonna call it gold toast. Oh, I thought you were going to say that he was strangely attractive because a lot of people find something about his sitting pose very appealing. You know, it's always more sexy when you recline on rubble. For extra lore, in the Japanese art, there's someone under the rubble he's sitting on. Oh my. What happened? I don't think he did it in a friendly way. How do you sit on someone in a friendly way? You have to use your words. Since Eldlich's effect synergizes with continuous traps and he doesn't really have an effect on the field, the deck works really well with floodgate traps like Skill Drain or goes in match in Rivalry of Warlords since all of his monsters are light zombies and you're not summoning much per turn usually so you could even use Summon Limit. If the deck gets hate, it tends to be from the floodgates and not the archetype specific stuff. Golden Lord's not that hateable of a guy, especially with that alternate art. I don't know why they went so hard, but it's nice that they did. Number 3, Dinomorphia. Dinomorphia is one of my favorite archetypes, but it puts you in a big risk-reward scenario. Your two main deck monsters set up your traps, with Therizia being the main searcher that lets you set a Dinomorphia trap from the deck directly to the field, and Diplo sends a Dinomorphia card from the deck to the graveyard. With these searches, your first priority is to always get your fusion traps on the field so you can get out your strong fusion monsters during your opponent's turn. Domain fuses any Dinomorphia monster from the hand, deck, or field, while Frenzy only works on your opponent's turn and uses one Dinomorphia from the deck and one from the extra deck. Your first resort is usually getting out your fusion monster, Dinomorphia Kentragena, whose effect banishes a Dinomorphia trap from your graveyard as a quick effect and it becomes her effect for the turn, so you can banish the fusion trap that just got her out to fuse two times in a row. Your next option is Dinomorphia Rex Term, the main floodgate of the deck, who needs a Dinomorphia fusion monster as one of its materials, which is why Frenzy using the extra deck for materials is vital. And now that Rex is on the field, it's time for the major catch of the deck. Each Dinomorphia trap and Cantragena's effect costs half your life points to activate, and Rex prevents your opponent from activating any monster effects on the field whose attack is equal to or greater than your current life point total. You probably see where this is going. You constantly cut your life points in half with your Dinomorphia traps and effects, so the ceiling for your opponent's monster effects keeps getting lower. Just by activating one of your fusion traps and Kentragena's effect brings you to 2,000 life points by the time Rex is ready, and even lower if you get to use any of your other Dinomorphia traps in the middle. So the name of the game is to protect Rex. He's basically indestructible by battle since he can have your own life points to lower your opponent's monster's attack points to whatever your life point total is for the turn, so you really just have to watch out for spells, traps, or monster effects from the hand or graveyard. Your main in-archetype traps that 
are probably helping you protect Rex include Dynamorpheus Sonic, which cuts your life points in half to negate a spell or trap if you destroy one of your Dynamorphia monsters, and it's a counter trap. Brute cuts your life points in half to destroy one of your Dynamorphia monsters and a card on your opponent's side of the field. And Alert, which cuts your life points in half to either revive one of your fusions if you lose them, or two of your smaller Dynamorphia monsters. For monster effect protection, Dynamorphia Intact is a counter trap that negates any monster effect for half your life points as long as you have a face-up Dynamorphia card on the field, which also protects your fusion traps from something like an Ash Blossom, since a trap that's already been flipped during a chain counts as a face-up Dynamorphia card. And since Dynamorphia also benefits from cutting their life points, you can just play a bunch of Solemn Judgment for extra protection. Solemn Judgment has always been great, even if it halves your life points, so Dynamorphia basically eliminates the downside. The rest of your Dynamorphia monsters also get benefits from low life points. Kentrogena loses attack points based on your life point total, but has 4,000 attack on default, so you want your life points way under 4,000. Their third fusion, Stealth Burgia, lets you use Dynamorphia effects, or any trap effects for that matter, without having to pay life points if your life points are 2,000 or below. Therizia gains 500 attack when she sets a trap with her effect if your life points are 2,000 or below, and Diplos deals 500 points of damage to the opponent when his effect is activated if your life points are 2,000 or below. If you run out of protection, Rex Term can revive Kentrogena when it's destroyed, Kentrogena can revive either of the main deck monsters when she's destroyed, and the main deck monsters can banish any trap from the graveyard when they're destroyed to revive the other one. If you're in a position where Rex is removed with no revival, the traps can act as a temporary backup plan in the graveyard to protect your low life point total, where the normal Dynamorphia traps can banish themselves to block effect damage, and the counter traps can block one hit of battle damage. I'm not sure what the lore reasoning is for these effects cutting your life points, but the traps are because they are thieves in a steampunk world, quietly planning a heist in the dead of night, and then blasting in to crash the party. The reason they're dinosaurs is because they've descended from an ancient life form species, and they theme their weaponry around them. Really, they meet the minimum requirement to be considered dinosaurs, but we rarely get dinosaur archetypes nowadays, so it's more variety than if you just made them machines or something. Plus, I can use Miscellaneousaurus with them. All their action poses on their traps are so cool. Frenzy is such a badass image of them with the lights and fire. Reversion is a cool guys don't look at explosions shot. Intact is a great destruction pose. Shell shows them with their masks on, which is a great armor design. And Alert is a nice shot of Therizia looking at the camera. Ain't she cute? The lady looks cool. I'm not so into the long tail, but I like the claws. All right, fine. How about their big fusion, Kentrogena? Ooh, she's pretty. Looks like she's wearing a plug suit. And Rex terms just as cool, right? This looks stupid. I'm going to tell you why. No, don't be mean to him. He's the best card in the deck. Because I, I can imagine his slice going, zoop, 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 zoop. And it being very, like, side-heavy, and when it dips, it just, like, falls to the right, falls to the left, falls to the right, falls to the left, and you can just go, bloop, and tap it over, and it'll fall. No! This is my soda! Oh, I scared him. Sorry, Bobo. So in the end, if you like their designs, and you're not afraid of your life points being at a low odd number total, Dynamorphia may be worth trying out. Number two, Trap Tricks. You know how Yu-Gi-Oh! retrains old archetypes all the time? Well, they sort of did it with the famous Trap Holes series of traps. Trap Holes fit the description of traps perfectly. There are various types of pitfalls that monsters fall into when summoned, depending on their stats or summoning method, and then something happens to them. The original just destroyed a monster with a thousand or more attack when summoned, and of the original bunch, Bottomless Trap Hole was a staple of decks for years, which banished a monster with 1500 or more attack points when summoned, making it harder to recover in the older formats. Over the years, we got other good traps holes, but they were falling out of the meta in favor of bigger destruction or disruption effects. It happens with power creep. But enter 2013 with the set Judgment of the Light. We got a small package of monsters in that called the Trap Tricks. They supported the trap holes. They were girls based on carnivorous plants, insects, and arachnids, with their names having the biological terms for whatever they were based on. It was even more evident with their new trap hole, Trap Tricks Trap Hole Nightmare. 
Here it implies if you fall into any trap holes, you might be getting eaten. This card shows the trap tricks as the arachnids or plants that they're based on, taking form to eat the poor souls who fell into the holes. I'm not sure if these are the girls' real forms or if they're just pets, but the vague light around the girls makes me think that their illusions fading away. Oh no, 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 this, this way is fine. You're fine. Just come with us. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Mermelio is the breakout star of the original trio, being the searcher for any trap holes. Atrax and Nepenthes were cool too, but ultimately didn't last in the archetype. Though Atrax will always be one of my favorites because she looks awesome and she lets you activate trap holes directly from the hand, and I'm a sucker for trap cards that play like that. The archetype was really nothing special until less than a year later when their new card Trap Tricks Dianai came out, which revives a Trap Tricks monster from the graveyard when normal summoned, cementing the archetype as part of the hat format deck with HAT being an acronym for Hand Artifact Trap Tricks, the three archetypes that made up the meta deck at the time. For the Trap Tricks portion, you would basically get Mermelio's search effect to get Trap Hole Nightmare in your hand, and then revive it later with Dianaya's effect, and since they were both level 4 monsters, you can get rank 4 Xyz summons with them. They even gave them their own Xyz monster a year later with Trap Tricks Reflasia, which lets you quick effect send a Trap Hole from your deck to the graveyard, and it becomes her effect making her a living trap hole. This was the boss for a while, and I like how much is going on with the art. Reflasia's in the center, and the other four trap tricks at the time are just chilling. This was every trap tricks. It was a cool little cameo. They're so nice together. I love the one with all the skulls. She's just like, this is where I nap. I murdered seven people to make my pillow. From then on, trap tricks may have not had meta relevance, but they stuck around, getting drips of support over the years. Mantis in 2017, which was the monster searcher of the deck, Sarah in 2019, which was the most important card for the archetype, Jen Lisea and Almo Maris in 2020, and Kularia and Vesiculo in 2021, the latter of which who I like because she looks so casual, like, hey, how's it going? You wanna come see my lair of toxins? They're organically made. As mentioned, Sarah gives this deck life to survive on its own. She's a Link 1, so any Trap Tricks monster can turn into her. Anytime you give a deck a Link 1 monster, you're giving them good support. Support. Besides being unaffected by traps, when a normal trap is activated by you or the opponent, she can special summon a Trap Tricks monster from the deck, and whenever a Trap Tricks effect is activated, she can set a trap hole from the deck. And the best Trap Tricks monsters have a second effect when special summoned, so there's a high likelihood you get both effects after a trap is activated. It gives you a nice resource line, and it made Sarah the face of the deck. Unfortunately, you could only use each effect once per turn, but still, they were good. And shoutouts to Alomaris for continuing the legacy that Reflasia started by featuring other trap tricks on her art. I feel like this is a photobomb moment where Sarah's like, Hey Al, we're going to McDonald's. You want anything? Hey, what are you looking at? She's the nice one. She's cute. I mean, she may not be nice, but she's cute and she looks nice. Tell that to the flower she's crushing. She may not be crushing it. She could just be holding it. That's a pretty firm grasp. You like her headcanon? For a while, this seemed like their fate. A control deck with small monsters that could say new card or two every other year, but in 2023, they blew the gates open with a Trap Trick structure deck that made the deck finally viable, not top tier, but at least rogue status. We now have Arachnocampa, who special summons herself as an extender, and Pudica, who searches your field spell, which brings up, they have a field spell now, that gives them an extra normal summon and battle protection, and it can special summon an extra monster from the hand or graveyard if you banish a card on the field, and most importantly, they have a trap monster now, which can activate the turn it's set if you discard a trap, triggering Sarah's effect, and then it can banish itself from the graveyard to revive a trap tricks, not during the same turn though. Not only that, but they put hole in her name so she's searchable by the other trap tricks effects. I like how they needed to have hole in there, so they just stuck it to the name of the actual plant that she's based on. Holutea looks surprisingly gentle holding that flower, or maybe she's emerging from an obvious trap like the ring girl from from a TV. You also got two new extra deck monsters. Pingu Kula searches a Trap Tricks monster and steals an opponent's monster as material that's removed by a card effect, and Adipus, who's the new boss, boosts all of your Trap Tricks attack by 1000, so now they can hit over bigger monsters, and she can negate and destroy monsters on the field if you banish a normal trap. This structure deck is a lot of what the Trap Tricks needed. They even gave them a new trap hole and their own version of trade-in with the deck. 
Plus, the deck included the hands and some artifact cards as a throwback to hat format. Final note, each Trap Tricks monster's attack and defense adds up to 2800, except the Lynx who have an attack that still ends in 800. Not sure if 2800 is some clever reference or just a gimmick they like, but I wanted to point it out. For number one, we gave the spot to the deck that could survive the most in the meta with its own tools alone and feels like the most powerful trap archetype to date. Are we being hyperbolic? I don't know, but they're pretty cool. Number one, Labyrinth. If you liked Labyrinth Wall back in the early sets, then boy do I have a maze for you, completely unrelated to that wall. Welcome to the Labyrinth Labyrinth, a giant castle led by lovely Labyrinth of the Silver Castle, who invites you in to find her, but along the way, you'll run into various traps and probably get lost. She's got various servants and bodyguards to help the mayhem, along with some dubious furniture. It all starts with Welcome Labyrinth, where the knight enters this maze. This is one of the first cards you would search if you don't already have it, where it lets you summon any Labyrinth monster from your deck when flipped, and you're generally going after one of your big bosses or one of the smaller ladies if the bosses are already here. Then when this trap is in your graveyard, you can set it again when your opponent's monster leaves the field due to a normal trap effect, so the deck benefits from using classic normal traps to trigger this, like Compulsory Evacuation, device, Torrential Tribute, or later ones like Ice Dragon's Prison. But the advantage doesn't stop there. If you have either Labyrinth Servant on the field during that trap activation, they can set another trap from the deck or special summon a Fiend monster, which all the Labyrinth monsters are. Another effect you get if a monster leaves the field due to a normal trap effect is Lovely Labyrinth can destroy a card on the field or in your opponent's hand. And if you have Lady Labyrinth, who is just the big boss in combat armor, she can set a different trap from the deck upon any normal trap activation. And if you have the castle field spell up when your trap is activated, you can summon an additional fiend monster, plus it destroys a card if Welcome Labyrinth was the trap activated. Not to mention, if you have some of their magic furniture monsters in your graveyard, they also trigger after a trap gets rid of your opponent's monster. Shandraglier goes back to the hand, and Stovey Torby summons itself. That's a lot of advantage over a single trap activation. I'm tired now. But still, how do you get Welcome Labyrinth on the field to easily jumpstart all of these effects and get another trap to combo with it? Easy, with the monsters. Ariana, the Labyrinth Servant, searches any Labyrinth card, including the main archetype traps and the furniture monsters, and Ariane special summons a level 4 or lower fiend monster, which could end up being Ariana, who then searches the trap. If you don't have them, then the furniture monsters can help. Both Shandraglier and Stovey Torb let you send them and a card from your hand to the graveyard to set any labyrinth spell or trap from your hand or deck, which then puts them in the graveyard so you can activate their other effects that I mentioned. And Ku Clock can send itself and a card from the hand to the graveyard to let you activate a trap the turn it was set, so you can get the ball rolling and summon out your boss ladies even faster. With all these methods, you'll be welcoming everyone to your labyrinth in no time. There's a few other cards that portray the struggle of venturing through this labyrinth that have niche effects for the deck, but there's one major trap left to cover. Big Welcome Labyrinth. Oh, they really got creative with that name. Where we learn that there's a lot of labyrinth left to go. Like, this is pure anime to be continued energy with this artwork. She's doing a full on oh ho 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 laugh right there, and the effect matches up with the epicness of the art. This is the other labyrinth trap that you'll likely be searching, and it lets you special summon a labyrinth monster from the deck, and then bounce one of your monsters on the field back to the hand, so if you have monsters to bounce, you're generally summoning one of your big ladies and bouncing a smaller monster. But if you have an empty field, Lady Labyrinth is the best boss to get since she would immediately have to be bounced due to the effect, and then you can just use her effect where she special summons herself from the hand after a normal trap is activated. Then when this trap is in your graveyard, you can banish it to bounce one of your cards or one of your opponent's cards back to the hand and you get good value from it. The card also features a lot of hints on future Labyrinth cards. The butler on it eventually became a monster that gives you even more trap searching capabilities, and the lady with an axe may already be a real card depending on how far in the future you're watching this video, but I'll keep quiet so this video doesn't stay too stuck in the past. So for all the craziness from just a few flipped trap cards, Labyrinth is set as the top trap archetype. Now what did you think? 
Were all these archetypes well equipped to face the meta, or are they doomed if Jinzo joins the party? Any good archetypes we missed? Let us know in the comments! Anyway, thank you all for watching, and we will see you in the next video!